In a previous video, I built a VGA raster generator out of some EEPROMs. Admittedly, some very large EEPROMs. And did it work? Well, judge for yourself. There's a star waiting in the sky. I do like building raster generators, but I've never actually built one using the famous Z80 microprocessor. The Z80 itself was a smashing success. It was used in the TRS-80, which is one of the three machines that helped spawn the home computer revolution. But the machine that had a big impact on me was the ZX81. This was my first computer, and what actually surprises me about it is the clever engineering that goes into it to make it so affordable. It used a clever technique called racing the beam to generate the video, which was also used by the Atari 2600. This is where the CPU is integral to the generation of the video signal. In fact, if the CPU stops, the video signal stops. Even just processing keystrokes is enough to interfere with the video. I've always wanted to do a deep dive into how the ZX80 and ZX81 generated video, and I'm going to start by just trying to get any stable image I can from the Z80, irrespective of resolution. Now at first, it'll be horribly impractical. But in subsequent videos, I'll add features like high resolution imagery, ROM based character generation, and using interrupt to generate HSync to the point where hopefully we can plug in a ZX80 or 81 ROM and get the machine to run. From this, we'll be able to see just how many tricks Sir Clive had to use to get this machine so affordable. I've gone over this graphic a number of times in various videos. So if you're familiar with it, you can skip ahead, but I'm just going to go over it now because it's fundamental to the design and I want each video to be independently watchable. To understand how raster generators work, we need to go back to cathode ray tube technology. There's an electron gun at the back of the tube which generates free electrons. These are accelerated towards the front of the screen and at the front of the tube we have three different types of phosphor. These glow either red, green or blue when they absorb the energy from the electrons. On the side of the tube we have some electromagnets and these allow us to steer the electron beam left, right, up and down. Some clever analog electronics inside the display uses these electromagnets to sweep the beam from left to right and top to bottom. We call this sweeping pattern a raster scan. We also have the ability to turn the electron beam on and off very quickly. In computers, this on and off pattern is coordinated with a dot clock. When viewed from the front, we sweep through the pattern and we turn the electron beam on and off so it makes a picture. We build this picture one line at a time and each of these lines is called a scan line. The flyback at the end of each scan line is controlled by a signal called horizontal sync. We gradually go down the image, then when we finally hit the bottom right, Another signal called vertical sync takes us back to the top left and we start again. To build a circuit that generates video, we need to be quite specific with the numbers. I did a deep dive into NTSC in a previous video, but the other main standard used throughout the world is called PAL, or phase alternating lines. It was first developed in Germany, but it was also used in Australia where I grew up. Just to be different from the previous video, I'll go over the mathematics used to generate the PAL signal. In this case, we start with a 13 MHz raw clock, which is then divided by 2 to give me a 6.5 MHz signal. This was the base frequency used by both the ZX80 and ZX81. The PAL horizontal sync frequency is 15,625 Hz, so 6.5 MHz divided by 15,625 gives us 416 pixels per scan line. I'm going to make the characters 8 pixels wide, so this gives us a total of 52 characters per scan line. Now, I need to clock the Z80 itself, so I'm going to divide our 6.5 MHz signal by 2 to give us a CPU clock of 3.25 MHz. If we divide this number by 15625, then we get 208 CPU clock cycles per scan line. This is actually a really important number, and we're going to spend a lot of our time working to this number. The Z80, and indeed most other microprocessors that I can think of, have an instruction called NOOP, or no operation. When the CPU does see this instruction, 
It goes through its normal instruction cycle, including DRAM refresh. The only changes to the internal state of the Z80 involve increasing the program counter by one and increasing the refresh register by one. We know that in the Z80, each no-op takes four clock cycles, so we can only execute 52 no-ops per scan line. Like NTSC, PAL has an interlaced display, and its ultimate frame rate is 25Hz, so the number of scan lines per frame is 15625 divided by 25, which gives us a total of 625 scan lines. Most of the computers of that era that could generate a PAL signal used a 50Hz progressive display mode, which also worked on these TVs and monitors. When we divide 15625 by 50, we get 312.5 scan lines in progressive mode, and we generally just round this down to 312. The first thing we need the Z80 to do is execute a bunch of no-ops to see if the program counter counts up. I have a Z80 inserted here with some pull-up resistors on the appropriate signals. On the right, we have a 555 timer generating a 1 hertz signal. This is just temporary, but this is the circuit that I'm using here. I want to start off by testing NOOP. The opcode for the NOOP instruction is 0. The easiest way to achieve this is to tie all the data lines going into the Z80 down to 0 volts through a set of 1K resistors. I've made this little contraption, which is just two resistor banks soldered onto some header strip. For some reason, the data pins on the Z80 aren't congruent. There's two lots of four bits which are separated by the VCC signal. This means I need to put this gap into our no-op generator. As a bit of a hint for what's coming up in following videos, I'll be making a different no-op generator later. The free end of the black wire needs to be connected to the ground. There we go, this is about as close to 3D art as I get. We've touched on this already, but the Z80 performs two memory operations per instruction fetch cycle. The first is the actual instruction fetch, where the contents of the program counter are outputted onto the address lines. During instruction fetch, the memory request, read, and M1 signals are all asserted, then at the end of cycle T2, the instruction on the data bus is sampled. The other operation is the refresh cycle. This is needed to keep the contents of dynamic memory alive. During the refresh cycle, the contents of the refresh register are outputted on A0 to A7, and the contents of the interrupt register are outputted on A8 through A15. To snoop on the address bus, I've made these little printed circuit boards which have eight LEDs mounted on them, a resistor network which provides a current limiting resistor for each LED, and some header strip to plug it into the breadboard. This black wire hanging off it is a common ground or common cathode through the resistors. To help keep track of where I am, here's an updated schematic diagram with the LED shown here in the upper right. For now, we only want to see what the program count is doing. So, if we connect the common cathode of the LEDs to the M1 bar signal, the LEDs only turn on when the contents of the program counter are presented on the address lines, and they'll be blank when the refresh address is asserted. After reset, with the no-op generator driving all the data lines low, we should just see the program counter incrementing with each no-op instruction that's executed. It's a bit hard to tell what's going on with the interleaved refresh cycles, so I've edited out this gap for each instruction in post-production. There we go, the famous no-op test doing exactly what it's supposed to do. This is a good start, but we'll need more than this to generate a video signal. I need to be able to program the Z80. To do this, I'm going to remove the resistor pack and the LEDs and replace them with an EEPROM. The lower 32k bytes of the address space will be taken up by the EEPROM and it'll be mirrored in the top half as well. To make construction a bit easier, I've also made these boards which are just a straight pass through. It's effectively 8 wires on a PCB with some pin header at each end. But the pin headers are spaced such that they perfectly straddle one of the gaps in the breadboard. I can use these to connect chips on either side of the power planes. By carefully placing the chips, A0 through A7 line up for the Z80 in the EEPROM. 
I use a similar board, which is a bit shorter to straddle the smaller gaps. Blue for the address bus, red for the data bus. I have this 74HC574 that I'm going to wire in, which is an Octal D type flip flop that just lets me peek on the instruction that's currently being executed. Now I need to do a little bit of wiring, add in all the power and ground signals. The middle blue jumper directly connects A0 through A7, but for the remaining lines, A8 through A14, I have to add some extra wires. Add in a wire for the clock signal. Excellent. Now I need to wire in all these data lines. And again, I'll do this by cutting individual wires. Here's the circuit diagram to date. This Octal D-type flip-flop is latched by the M1 bar signal, and this shows the instruction last fetched from the ROM. The board's ready for testing. I've put in all the red data bus signals and all the LED displays. Now that the first phase of the hardware is built, let's have a look at how we program it. The first thing I'm going to do is think about our Z80 memory map as being a two-dimensional array of 64 by 512 elements. It's actually just one contiguous piece of memory, but it's easy to think about it this way. I'm going to flood fill the entire memory space with zeros or no op instructions. This will provide an up counter for our raster generator. Let's keep track of the instructions I've used. So this is the no op, which has an op code of zero in hexadecimal. Now, conceptually, I want to divide the memory space up into three areas unused, inactive and active. This provides me with an active area that's 32 columns wide and 192 rows high. Now I want to have the program counter stay within the active and inactive areas, with one exception that I'll come across a bit later. To do this, I'm going to use the jump instruction. This is a 3-byte instruction with an opcode of C3, followed by the jump address. Overall, it takes 10 clock cycles. Each element in a row is going to have 49 no-ops, then at locations 49, 50 and 51, there'll be the jump instruction. This jump instruction will then skip to the start of the next row. I do this for all the rows in the blue region, so that at the end of row 0, we go to row 1 and so forth. I repeat this all the way down, then once I hit the bottom of the blue inactive area, we want to jump back to location 0 and start again. Let's add jump to our list of instructions that we've used so far. This has an opcode of C3. I've added it here on the bottom row. Now, if you haven't realized it yet, each row within the memory is meant to be a scan line. We know that the 49 no-ops have 4 clock cycles each, and the jump instruction takes 10 clock cycles, so the whole scan line will be 206 clocks. But this is a bit of a problem. We know from our timing calculations, we want each scan line to be 208 Z80 CPU clocks. What I'll do is find another instruction that I can replace one of the no-ops with that will take 6 clock cycles to make the total 208 clocks. The 16-bit register increment instruction seems to fit the bill. I'm going to add in the increment BC instruction just before the jump. We don't actually use the BC register, so this shouldn't matter to us. This increment takes 6 clocks, and it takes our total back up to 208 for the scan line. Let's add it to our list of instructions that we've used. This instruction has an opcode of 03 hexadecimal. Now, our Z80 should scan through each row at 15625Hz, and scan through the entire field at 50Hz, which matches the PAL video system. Next, we want to add in some sync signals so our monitor can lock onto the signal. We have a relatively wide horizontal sync signal, which is in the inactive region per scan line. And down the bottom, we also have a vertical sync which takes two scan lines. What I need now is a way of figuring out how to generate this sync signal in real hardware. When we look at the instructions we've used so far, one thing we should be able to see is that bit 5 is always zero. This means we should be able to find an instruction with an opcode that sets bit 5, and we can use this to represent sync. 
In the hardware, I can detect this bit being set in the instruction by using a flip-flop clocked off the M1 bar signal. The complement A instruction has an opcode of 2F hexadecimal, bit 5 is set, and it takes 4 clock cycles. So I can easily put it in place of a no-op instruction when I want to generate a sync signal. For every scan line, horizontal sync occurs in our inactive region, and I just need to replace 4 of our regular no-ops with 4 complement A instructions. We still have 208 clocks per scan line, but now we have a horizontal sync signal. To generate vertical sync, we choose two scan lines where we set every instruction to be complement A. This is a bit tricky because I don't want the jump instruction to interrupt the sync signal. I'll violate our rule about the unused area and I'll generate 108 complement A instructions in a row and then I'll put the jump at the end of it. Now our timing should be correct and we should have a sync signal, but we actually want to put something on the screen. If we go back to the list of Z80 instructions we've used, bit 4 hasn't been used by any other instruction so far. It turns out the rotate right A instruction has an opcode of 1F and it takes 4 clock cycles as well, so I think that'll be a pretty good candidate. This effectively only gives me 32 pixels per scan line, but we'll start with that. Whenever I want a pixel to appear, I replace the no up with the rotate right A instruction. This means bit 4 of my instruction becomes my video data signal. Again, I can capture both sync and data with a flip-flop that's clocked on the rising edge of M1 bar. Here we have the circuit running on some arbitrary scan line using the 555 timer. We're counting up with the scan line, and you can see that the data signal is flashing on and off for our display. We'll keep going until we get to column 37. Then the sync signal turns on, and it's on for 4 clock cycles. We get to the end of the scan line, and we can see the C3 opcode for the jump. Now, I need some way of combining our video signal and our sync signal to generate a composite video signal, which I can then feed into a monitor. This is an emitter follower circuit that Steve Wozniak developed for the Apple II computer. I've used this quite a bit, so I'm very comfortable with it, and I think I'll use it again now. This is the final design I'm going with. You can see the Z80 and the EEPROM in the middle. On the far left, I've replaced the 555 timer with a 13 MHz oscillator. This is divided in four using a 74HC161 counter. I only need to capture two bits from the data stream during the instruction fetch cycle, bits four and five for data and sync respectively. But I actually want the inverse of our sync signal, so rather than using an octal D type flip flop, I'll just use a 74HC74 dual D type flip flop to catch the data and sync signals. This is the C code I used to generate the EEPROM image. Flood fill the memory with no ops. Add in some text. Add in horizontal and vertical sync. Now, let's see if it works. And success. I'm generating this image, which is 32 pixels wide by 192 high, using only the Z80 and EEPROM and a couple of simple support chips. In the next video, I'm going to try and increase the resolution of the display to 256 by 192 pixels, so come and join me to see how I do that.